welcome to Beyond the Shoots as presented by Parasite Systems. I'm your host, Doug Simcox, and I hope that you're having a great day, staying safe, and enjoying these between the holiday times. Today we're recording in Buffard, New York. BTC is on the road again. Actually, maybe that's not c- completely correct. BTC is recording in BTC Studios North on the Rawhide Branch. And sitting with the table is my co-host, Mr. Sam Swearingen, saddle bronc rider, winning the North American Rodeo Commission Championship two times, a stock contractor, a rodeo coach, mentor, guide, and today, as I said, my co-host. And today we're going to be talking about the start of Sam's contracting business, starting the Rawhide Rodeo Company. So Sam, how are you today? Um having a great day doug how are you ah uh, it's it's a, it's a good day it's a good day beautiful day uh woke up this morning saw a real nice uh probably a six point buck out the back window there in your backyard wasn't quite light light enough for me to tell how many points but i counted at least uh at least two on a side the big ones that i could count so i'm guessing a six pointer but nice buck. And then you looked over my shoulder here as you're looking across the road and you saw how many how many head of deer out there. I, I didn't count them. There's probably 10 or so. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the beautiful, beautiful Rawhide Ranch um, up here. 400 acres, Sam? Yeah, a little over 400. A little over 400 acres. And we're going to talk a little bit about about the Rawhide Rodeo Farm and the ranch and how how that came to be. But today we want to talk about the business of rodeo. Um, so all of our folks that go to a rodeo, that get to, get to purchase the tickets and sit in the stands and see the great performances that the Rawhide Rodeo Company puts up, we want to talk today about how the rodeo contracting business came to be part of your, your family, Sam, how you started it, and uh, then we want to step through some business of it. So let's get started with the basics. Tell us about starting the rodeo company. I believe it was in 1987. Yeah, um, we, we started the Rawhide Rodeo uh, just on a, I had a pretty good year riding Bronx. And uh, the accountant says, well, you're going to owe some money for taxes and things that you've done. And. I was running in another business with a friend of mine, and it was a good year, and might have been the last real good year I had for a long time, but uh, (laughs) uh, he said, you're going to have to pay X amount unless you decide to do something with it, so uh, I decided to start the rodeo company, and good, bad, or otherwise, you know, it's been run the gamut every different way, but uh, the Lord has blessed me in ways that uh, I didn't think were good at the time, but, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, I went and bought some horses in, uh, in an arena and that's how I got started. Okay. And had you always kind of had that as a goal or something potential out there in the future? Never, never, never. It, it actually is kind of the opposite because back in the day when early on, when I was riding, most of the contractors were grumpy old men that, mm-hmm. uh, mm-hmm. were, miserable and now i know why uh but uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. no never the thought yeah. really hadn't crossed my mind but kind of knew a little bit of li- livestock and uh didn't know much other in the world so uh went that route so so when you were riding you went to a lot of the big rodeos a lot of rodeos all across the united states did you pay attention to the production did you did you talk to contractors and say how how are you doing this? Um, not until I decided to do it, yeah. and then like if I got off, I'd go sit in the stands and listen to the crowds okay. more than talk to people. Okay, uh, I I just listened and yeah. what hear the chatter and what they liked, and you know it uh, it gave me a perspective of. I wasn't so concerned about the uh, contractors or the contestants. I was concerned about the people in the stands okay. that, that were paying the money to put on the show. Yeah, yeah. And and you said you went out and you bought some horses. Where'd you get the horses? Do you remember? The first batch I bought from Jim Zinzer out of Michigan. Okay. Uh, 
Yeah, I went and bought maybe six or eight off of him the first trip, and then, you know, branched out, and then I bought another group from him later, mm -hmm. about two years after I was in the business, and just started purchasing ones from it, bucking stock sales and from people. It really helped. If I was on the road and there was a horse or something I liked from a contractor riding, I mm -hmm. could try to buy them from okay. them. Okay, okay. Yeah. Were you successful at that? Sometimes. Sometimes, you yeah. Know, depends how much green you flashed at them. Right, right. <laughs> um, and of the six that you bought from Zinzers, and he's a rodeo stock contractor up in Michigan, of the six that you bought, all successful campaigners for you? Uh, not really. No. Uh some were hit and miss. They were all young, and uh, they wouldn't work for his program, but he had an elite program. <clears throat> uh, but a couple of them turned out to be decent horses, and mm. it, they were. it was a learning experience, you know. Mm. Sometimes they were really good. Well, what did I do? He bucked this time, but I don't think it was a whole lot that you did different. Just sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't. So when you say learning how they bucked the best, are you talking about flanking them? That that was the biggest part. You know? Was it? Yeah. And you had not flanked horses before? Oh, well, I had some, hey. but not a lot where I paid mm. attention, you know, mm. you just, just flanked them. And, uh, and, and there's an art to it. Well, I don't know if it, you'd call it an art. Some mm. horses take different flanks, mm. really tight flanks, really loose flanks. You know, mm -hmm. um, I bought a horse off Mike Ladding that he said, just hang it on him. Don't, don't, oh, don't even do, pull it yeah, tight. He said, just, just enough to stay on his back. And, you know, first, couple times I thought it was loose but it wasn't um, and as it went on I learned what he was talking about and yeah. uh, I it, it was kind of a horse that I would be talking to somebody acting like I wasn't paying attention you're like oh you're gonna miss the flank did <laughs> say you're gonna, yeah it, it was just a little bump and that yeah, was it that was it and that horse really was outstanding um, I switched sides on him later on in life, and he was just phenomenal. Really? Yeah. Okay. So when you say switch sides. Thank you, because, yeah, yeah I, I, you yeah. just take it for granted. People yeah. know what you're talking about. Right. But um, there is what we call a left and right-hand delivery. Mm -hmm. uh, Mike Ladding only had left-handed bucking shoots, so that horse always went out the left-hand side. And what we did was... Uh, the left hand delivery, if you're sitting on the animal, your arm is on the buck and shoot. Your left hand arm is on the shoot gate itself. I see. I see. Right hand, the opposite. And uh, once that horse, and the reason Mike sold him is that six, he would buck so hard for six seconds and then he would get to whirling and didn't want to keep okay. going. Okay. And when I switched sides on him, he, it was, you know, just he kept bucking the whole time i don't know what the difference is but uh it was what he did and and why would you switch sides with him if you thought you had a formula at that point um because he would at six seconds would so start, you just tried him right okay you know, okay let, let's do something different because okay. uh, you know when i first brought him over and when he sold him to me he told me he said he'll work in your country because they won't ride him mm -hmm. until mm -hmm. that six seconds Okay. And he did. They, you know, they he bucked them off and bucked them off right steady. Yeah. And then when I switched sides, it didn't. And I started doing bigger rodeos with better contestants. Um, he kept bucking, and I took him to actually the North American Rodeo Commission finals one year. Okay. And uh, made the short go out of probably 150 head of horses. Oh wow. And, was outstanding, you know. I I still remember the announcer when he bucked the guy off in the short round. The guy said, "Sam, where did you ever get a horse like that?" <laughs> yeah, and I didn't give much money for him because he wasn't working for him. I see. Wow, wow. So each each horse, each animal has kind of its own favorite kind of move. 
Yeah, you have to mess Learn. with them and uh, see what what they like and what they don't like. And okay, and it, it, it's kind of difficult to do that at a rodeo because so many things are going on. Yeah, you know. Yeah, uh, it, it, it's hard to pay attention. Yeah, and at most rodeos, you tried to flank your own stuff always. Yes. Okay. So even if you took a North America Rodeo Commission to that big rodeo, you were there with your horse all the way through the process? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, and you also talked about, in addition to buying horses, you talked about buying an arena. Yeah. What does that mean? A portable rodeo arena. Okay. Um, it's where they ha you have the buck and shoots and the fences and the back pens, and you bring it in. You could go into a cornfield and set up your rodeo. Okay. So all the panels for the arena, where did you find something like that? I actually uh, worked roofing for a man in Virginia mm -hmm. that uh, had a, started a rodeo company, and uh, it didn't work out for him, and he had it for sale, so I bought it from him. Okay. And how did you, I mean, this is a lot of steel, right? All the, all the arena panels. Uh, had not only the buck and shoots, but the timed event shoot as well? Correct. Okay. So complete rodeo, back pins, decent amount of back pins to, for the, to, um, uh, to pen the, the cattle and the calves and the bucking horses and the bulls. How'd you get them down the road, all this iron? Well, when I started, I had two trailers. Uh, okay. We haul the arena fences you know on a semi and uh i put the buck and shoots on a gooseneck trailer okay and uh did it that way so as time went on i uh got a, you know and fuel prices went crazy there at five dollars a gallon and mm -hmm. we just went went from two to one semi trailer which it, it it was light enough and all that. You just had to do some different things, and now they have it really down on how to haul it and yeah. what kind of panels to buy and yeah. you know, to make it all fit comfortably. So once you were completely loaded with the single tractor and trailer, what was your weight, do you know? Um, it wasn't real bad. It might have been about 65,000 really? in total. That many yeah. pounds. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And when you, and we're going to talk a little bit about a typical week, but when you got to the rodeo, how did you unload all this iron? Well, in the contract, it calls for a forklift or something with forks to unload the arena. Mm -hmm. Wasn't always the case, you know, they mm -hmm. come in with a tractor with bale spears or, you know, a forklift that's made for concrete and yeah. it uh, didn't always work out the way you wanted, but. Yeah. Uh, moving a lot of iron yeah it, it, and that's it's not such a bad job if you got the right equipment to do it if you got the wrong equipment it's pretty dangerous mm -hmm. and it it is a very difficult job yeah and the arena panels they were about and i'm talking about building the sides of the arena and that sort of thing how how long were those panels and about what did one weigh um they're 12 my arena panels were 12 foot long okay and the first arena I bought, they were a WW panel that is called a classic, and they are the heavy ones they use in the back pens now. They didn't have the ones with the legs on them. You had to have a post for every one. Okay. And they, I, they, they do have the correct weight of all these, but they're probably a little over a hundred pounds each. Okay. And now the arena panels that they use are with the legs and stuff already on them you just pin them together they're probably about 75 pounds okay each. so two people per panel typically can move them around yeah two okay. people easy um the amish guys and dale and colton towards the end it was all give me one and i'll run over here with it you know it's kind of a contest to them yeah but, uh, yeah not me okay yeah you part know. of their part of their rodeo conditioning, wasn't it? It must be, yeah. <laughs> and not me. I always get the back because that's a lot easier to carry than the front. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. And yeah. to this day, it's kind of funny when I'm setting up panels around the ranch here. We, uh, I, I can almost go perfectly to the twelve foot. Yeah. Because 
you've done it and you almost you know your back can be to the 12 foot thing and you almost stop right and pin it up <laughs> you know where you are yeah absolutely and and talking a little bit about the ranch beautiful country up here um you have a little over 400 acres and when did you buy the when, how'd you put the ranch together up here it's all it's all connected right Yes, it's all connected. Uh, when I first, I was rent, renting the place at first. Mm. Um, that's how it all got uh, started. I was renting it for about three years, and then it came up for sale. Okay. And All of it? All of it. They had a 1,000 acres. Oh, wow. Okay. To, okay. To here. Yeah. And it wasn't all connected, but uh, that 1,000 acres, there's a... Oh, there's 400 or 100 acres I didn't buy that right along the road that I let a guy that worked for me buy because mm-hmm. he is a good worker and I mm-hmm. wanted him to stay on. Mm-hmm. And then he met a girl and oh, yeah, it was gone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he put it up for sale for two and a half times and I'm just stubborn enough. I didn't want to buy it. <laughs> I bought some of it, but yeah. not all of it. Not all of it. Anyway, um. To start out, actually, this side of the road that you are sitting on Mm -hmm. uh, would be the east side next to the river, the Genesee River. Across the river, they had some really nice river bottom ground. Yeah. And. uh, So crop ground? Yes, really good crop. It's just fantastic river bottom. So what I did is uh, I had a friend of mine that I knew was a good, honest guy. You couldn't do this with everybody, but Mm -hmm. I didn't think he would uh, take advantage of the situation. I took him down there, and I said, what would you give for this river bottom? Yeah. And, of course, he gave me a low low ball figure because he's tighter than tight. But that's (laughs) a good, good, fair guy, Yeah. you know, and— he told me what he'd give, and there was about 120 acres of river bottom and about 100 and some acres on this side of the road where we are now, which went all the way down to the barn at one time. Okay. I've sold some off since. Okay. But uh, when I put the bid in for the 200 and some acres here, I put in exactly what he said he'd give me. Oh, wow. Okay. So I had this hundred and some acres free and clear i see so okay i did that and that allowed me to buy across the road there's about another hundred acres across the road and i bought that fairly you know within a year or so okay which in today's world would have never happened Mm -hmm. you wouldn't sit on ground you know it was probably over a five or six year period where i bought the 400 acres really and they were willing to just parcel it off as you can afford it sam well, it was for sale the whole time. Yeah, yeah. But it wouldn't be for sale now, for you know. Yeah. So when I bought that, and then a couple of years later, I went to the bank. I wanted to buy another 50 acres, and, you know, that it was hard to get the money for vacant land. Yeah. You know, nobody yeah. wanted to give it to you. But um, in some negotiations, I got that done. And then there was another um, about... 180 acres left on this side of the road uh, mm-hmm. on, that uh, I got last. And, you got last. Yeah. So three separate purchases. Actually four. Four. I, was, I okay. bought the three from the company, and then I bought some ground from uh, Chip McGuire that used yeah. to work for me. I yeah. bought an extra okay. 16 acres that I thought was mine and mm-hmm. built some catch pens and stuff on. And, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Ended out being his. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> so. Uh, yeah. And then all the improvements. I mean, you put you fenced everything. You went at it pretty hard, Sam. The day I bought it, that they closed, it was in October, and I started in. You started in. And uh, this, where the house is and this side of the road was nothing but thorns and thickets, and nothing had been done with this and probably... 30, 40 years. Oh, know, wow. Nothing okay. at all. Okay. And 
across the road was starting to grow up into thorns. That had been pasture, mm-hmm. and uh, so it wasn't so bad. But this, it, it took some real work to clear the thorn trees out. Yeah, yeah. Must be the thorn trees like the clay ground because it was <laughs> coming on. You had, you had a lot of, and good fencing. You, there were programs you could get part of? Yeah, I got into a, I call it a fencing program. I don't know what it is. And uh, there again, we did the work ourselves, most of it, mm-hmm. and uh, saved some money. But if I'd have known now what I, or then what I know now, yeah, I would have done it completely different on, you know, more of what the program wanted for cattle. I could have... <clears throat> ran cattle and somebody that knew or took care of them while we were gone would have okay. it would have been a nice nice setup for that but uh, yeah. yeah yeah okay and when did you build this house this was uh, this is your most recent uh, build yeah this would have been about 15 years ago about 15 years ago yeah okay beautiful house laid out nice decorated so well just just a neat place sam well, thank you, Doug. Yeah, it uh, feels very, very homey, you know, <laughs> feels very comfortable. <laughs> Carrie had a nice touch, huh? She did. <laughs> I tell you, it's, yeah, beautiful house. Lots of sunlight, lots of deer in the pastures and so forth. So, so going back, um, you decide you're going to, you're going to buy six Bronx and you keep adding to your Bronx and you, you decide to buy a full arena uh, with a guy that you were doing some roofing work for and... Did you have a rodeo lined up yet when you started buying? No. You did? No. So you just started stocking up? Yeah. And the arena was probably the first purchase because that didn't eat anything. And it it, 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 uh, it was good. But, yeah, I did not have a rodeo lined up. The first rodeo I did, um, did it for, uh, it was in Cumberland, Maryland, at the, uh, I think it was the Allegheny County Fair. At a fair. At a fair, yeah, on a Wednesday night. And the reason that happened was I was traveling with Howard and Clinton Cessna, and it was basically there out of Pennsylvania, but right at the Maryland border, and that was their fair. Okay. So uh, they they came down. He knew what I was doing and said, well, uh, went to the committee at the fair board, and they said, well, we'll give him a shot. And, wow. First one. So it's all about relationships, people that know you, that uh, you know. And and for our listeners, Howard and Cessna, great bull riders. And you were traveling with them then. Great bull riders, great people. Yeah. Just just good people. And, uh, of course, Howard rode good, but Clinton rode amazing. Yeah. You know, yeah. it was... And Howard loved it, and Clinton just did it because he could. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So and he he we should talk with him one day, Sam. You should. We should. Absolutely. He he made PBR and everything, right? Yeah, he made the PBR finals the same year one of my bulls made the PBR finals. Okay. Okay. So so you've got this rodeo. Was that a oh my goodness, what am I going to do now kind of a moment for you? Uh not really. No. Um I had in my mind what I would do. The biggest challenge was the arena. I had never set one up. Okay. And if and you, you didn't do a practice set up at the house before no, you went. No, I got it. We, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. It was it was a challenge to say the least. It yeah. was uh, yeah. every time you did something, you had to do it two or three times because oh, you need this panel over here and that over there, and uh, there again, hindsight, I should have had somebody that knew what the hell they were doing because yeah. I sure didn't. And it was like a 24-hour process to really? do, do this. Okay. And, so yeah. two, two trailers to get there. Mm-hmm. Um, any issue? Where would you get the trailers? They come with the arena? No. no? Uh, actually, the first, I rented a truck and a semi okay. to haul it down there, truck and trailer, okay. from a, a friend here. Okay. <clears throat> So we got that done, and uh, it was two trailers. I'm just trying to think back here. Yeah. And it was 
yeah, it was a long process. And I don't, I think that year it was okay. Uh, I painted the panels aluminum so they were silver. Okay. Yeah. And yep. the lights hit in the arena fence, the horses couldn't see it. And really? A lot of horses hit the fence. Really? Yeah. Okay. And then it was like, oh, they, you know, it, that that was dumb. <laughs> wow. And uh, <clears throat> how would you even know something like that before you just did it, right? Uh, I guess you learned it after because it was <laughs> yeah. didn't work. And and that was the only place I really had an issue because the lights were bright down. I see. I see. I see. So, uh, yeah, that was a learning experience. Mm -hmm. And the next year, going back to the same place, it came a flood. I mean, a flood. It was so bad that cars hit each other in the parking lot. I mean, sitting there it washed them into oh, washed each them other together really and uh when we were loading to get out the semi got stuck we had to call wreckers and like three wreckers to pull a pot load of stock out and it was so expensive and such a such a nightmare yeah yeah and and when you say a pot okay big trailer yeah it's what they call a possum belly trailer it's double decker that you can put animals on the top and the bottom and it uh probably weighs into like the eighty thousand pound range and it yeah it, it was a tough day <laughs> yeah tough night there yeah and and do you remember from the first rodeo um how did you do financially the very first one was okay. Was okay. You know, yeah. yeah. It, it, it was good. And not only good financially, I had two other com committees come up to me and want to do rodeos. Oh, really? As a yeah. result of that rodeo? As a result of that. Wow. One. Yeah. Wow. So, uh, yeah, financially, the first one, everything went smooth and went right what it should. Yeah. Um, after that. The next year, yeah, it wasn't so good with what it cost for the wreckers and yeah, and all yeah, that. But yeah. uh, and and had you started to put together a crew yet at that Sam? At that point, I should say the first few. The first year, I did three rodeos. Okay. Um, no, didn't have much of a crew. Gathered guys that I knew. Okay. You know, yeah. I was young enough. You had guys young enough to go down and help you and and do things for you yeah it, it really wasn't a crew it was a you know makeshift volunteer crew a volunteer well, bunch right yeah um yeah they volunteered you paid them but they volunteered to go down and do yeah. this crazy Retrap. thing for you good yeah. people yeah you know people yeah. you could count on and uh yeah then after that uh, when i really didn't have a crew till i kind of quit riding okay and uh okay that's when the business took off was the years you know a couple years following quit, quitting writing and that would have been 90 99 2000ish okay you know okay in that era okay so up to then you were still riding still competing and you'd put on three rodeos a year yeah three like the first year was three and it might have been six or seven the second year okay and okay it, it kind of snowballed you know, after that, it, yeah. uh, you know, and for about 10 years, that's all I did until I quit riding. Okay. And did it, how did it affect your riding? Did it uh, cost you good rodeo dates, meaning where you would elect to go off and do a run somewhere? Uh, yeah. Um, but I, and I had slowed down some what I, you know, didn't, wasn't going as hard. Mm -hmm. Uh, but yeah, it, uh, if you had weeks of a uh, weekend rodeo, it, uh, it eliminated them right out of the picture. Right. Yeah. And what would have been more financially successful putting on that rodeo yourself or making that rodeo run, right? Well, and 
paper, you made more putting the rodeo on. Yeah. But don't count feeding the livestock and everything yeah. you yeah. you had that went into it. You got uh, stuff on feed all through the week, don't you? Yeah, all yeah. through the year. Yeah. Uh, so. Yeah. And in those early years, so let's let's go to 99, 2000. Um, that's when you really started to pick up your rodeo count. You started doing high school rodeos. Yes. And they would start pretty early in the year. Was that a pretty successful run for you? Um, it wasn't financially very successful. Mm -hmm. um, you made some money, but mm -hmm. you didn't. That was a time of the year where you weren't making anything anyway. So okay. Okay. if you left there with a thousand dollars, you know that's a thousand you didn't have. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, if you if you look at it now, it didn't make sense, but at the time it did. Yeah, because uh, you didn't have anything else. Yeah, but the high school at first, I I didn't. They were. How did I say this? Kind of good. They, they were so much sticklers on rules like you can't if if somebody got a re-ride or a malfunction of the gate or something. Well, you can't do anything else. Do you do that? So uh -huh. here you <clears throat> here you're trying to put a show on. You do have some spectators in there yeah and you're trying to put a show on and they're saying no you got to buck that re-ride right now well, really it, it uh there was a few things that did uh were challenging mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. you you knew that the kids were going to be the future and if you didn't start bringing them up and uh bringing them on nobody would right and it uh and there were some points where i had way too much livestock for them were too rank, uh, but that's all I had. So we, af as we went on, I kind of transitioned to helping the kids more with the li on the livestock end. Meaning, give them a little bit of coaching, a little bit of help. A uh, little bit of coaching, but more getting the right livestock. Right livestock, you know. Okay. After you know, you went from twenty horses on into you know, up over 200 at one point, you could really pick what would work good for the high school kids and, and take them. You had 200 head here on the ranch. Yes. Oh my goodness. Am I proud of that? No, but yes, right. I did. <laughs> but, but you purposefully expanded your herd so that you could get livestock Bronx that would work for the high school cowboys and cowgirls. Well, you didn't purposely for the high school kids, Okay, but uh, you know, if they weren't the caliber you wanted for the other, yeah. Um, yeah. It worked out. Okay. So. Uh, okay. And uh, of those of those high school years, and you did that for a lot of years. Kind of a dumb question, but good practice for putting on rodeos. Very good. Okay. Very good. Um, it, it it lets you see your mistakes, and it wasn't as cut and dried. It you have to do this and you have to do that at that time, you know, but uh, mm -hmm. it gave you a feel of how to organize it to make it better yeah. for the other rodeos. Yeah. <clears throat> practice setting up, practice putting a crew together, right? At that point, you said time to get serious about, if not a full-time crew, a crew that I can depend on week after week? Yeah, Um and a lot of the crew came from the kids on the high school rodeo. Oh, did you know, okay. um, that didn't have any other means and really wanted to do it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, you you put a crew together that once you had enough, once I had ten or twelve rodeos, you needed a crew that was going to be here. And yeah, we started picking and choosing, or or who would pick and choose us to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, because mm -hmm. it was not a easy lifestyle and without rooms and board and like that, you know, living in the basement. And So yeah. they lived right here on the ranch <clears throat> with you. They had day-to-day -day chores and, and work that they were doing before you ever got to the rodeo. That was the kind of person I wanted. That's what you wanted. Yeah. Okay. That's what I thought I wanted. Yeah. You know, because you, you know, we, uh, in the summertime we'd make hay and, all the feed for our own livestock. So, you know, when you got home at four in the morning, 
you know, you get the guys and then you go over and work it doing the hay and and all that and the one guy that trucked for me he he said you're gonna kill them sam they're not you right you know uh right you're gonna work them till nine o'clock at night and then we're gonna get in a vehicle and we're gonna go and you know use a wonderful thing but uh in hindsight again you know i enjoyed having the kids around and helping them because they all wanted to ride to work for me Mm -hmm. and it uh on me personally, it'd have been easier to hire some older adults that wouldn't be so challenging on the road. You didn't mm-hmm. have to babysit them so much, mm-hmm. and were more responsible and knew exactly what to do. Yeah. So most of your crew were were older teenagers in in their early twenties, that sort of thing. Yeah, most of them were high school age or just out of high school that wanted to to do it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And knowing what you know, what you know now. If you could have applied that back. And I, and I want to, before I ask this question, I want to make a bit of a statement here. You, because of the youngsters you were bringing in and their desire to ride, you had an opportunity to coach and help some of these cowboys go on and, and be quite successful in the rodeo arena. So I want to I want to weigh that against having that more mature crew that if you were to do it today, how would you balance? How would you structure you know, that the young kids were the most enjoyable part of it. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. uh, they caused different challenges, but they were the most helping them. And you didn't have a lot of time to sit down, but you, you'd you always make little statements or what to do. Um, yes, that that was watching them go on and do do well in the rodeo world was, was the best part of putting on the rodeos. Mm-hmm. Um, so if I'd have had that other crew that knew what they were doing and didn't want to ride or whatever, it, a balance would have been great. Um, and also if you'd have had the time to take them and work the ranch and then at three o'clock say, okay, we're going to go to the practice bed. You might not get on animals. Mm-hmm. You might do different things to help you, but okay. you could have even took that to the next level. And I don't think it was so much of what I did. It was more of putting them on the right livestock. You you knew where their levels were because they're around you all the time. Mm-hmm. Okay, mm-hmm. you get on this one today, and mm-hmm. you get on that one, mm-hmm. and we're going to see how it goes. And And part of the crew you had as a necessity not only set everything up, but also to put the show on, meaning you needed bronc riders. You needed bull riders in a lot of situations and to have your own crew and they, they were there to get on stuff, right? Yes. Um, that was the biggest advantage I had over the other stock contractors and it didn't matter so much in the early years because there was a lot of contestants, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but as it went on, that was a huge, huge advantage because I had these young kids that wanted to ride and you could do it. And you could typically count on how many, let's say, in the bareback bronc riding, just from your crew that traveled with you. Yeah, I usually had about five or six kids that rode. Okay. And three were usually horse riders and, you know, three were bull riders. Yeah. So uh, you, you could do something. If you didn't have contestants, you could do something. Yeah. Okay. And no issue with them riding. I mean, they they typically would ride, let's say it's a three-day rodeo, they typically would ride in competition for the money one one night. Any issue that you ever heard them riding the night before and them riding the night after? (laughs) Any kind of unfair? Not in the rough stock end. Okay. Okay. Um, Did have some steer wrestlers at one time. A guy called me and said, you know, you know what I'm calling about? And I said, no, I, I don't have a clue what you're calling. Well, these guys are running them steers, and, you know, before their competition or whatever, they're learning their steers. And I said, well, that, that's fine and good. You bring me steer wrestlers, and we won't have to do that. But I got to put on a, have enough to put on a good show for the for the crowd. Yeah. 
but on the rough stock end, never. Never? No. Okay, okay. And before we move off the high school rodeo, I'm, you saw a lot of talent come through that arena. Um, we were looking at some, at some standings last night. Um, young man comes out of Pennsylvania, bull rider. He's now 35 years old, qualified for the uh, NFR. Yeah, um, it's probably his sixth or seventh qualification for the NFR. Yeah, yeah, a good kid. Yeah, smart and family. His mother time for me for years, and uh, Gene Askey's his mother. Yeah, right. So Jeff Askey, we're talking about. He he got a college scholarship through Pennsylvania High School Rodeo, right? And went and rode basically for uh, University of Tennessee at Martin. Oh, in Tennessee. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And not only did he get a college scholarship, he won the college national championship. Yeah. And uh, his mother was working for me that day that uh, he won it. Oh, and, uh, oh okay. okay. Yeah, it was a good day. And I, I remember telling her the day before, you know, if you want to go out there and see him because he'd made the short round. Yeah. And she just couldn't do it. And I said, well, we'll, we'll work it out so you can go. And no, she didn't go. And I said, well, wild horses couldn't drag me away from that. Yeah. And lo and behold, when Dalen won the national championship, I was at the same rodeo and couldn't get away. Right. Because he had responsibilities, right? Yeah. Had responsibilities. Did you see him? Did you see his talent coming through? Could you spot that? Uh, freshman in high school? Yes. You, you could. And not so much as riding talent, but okay. how he took care of himself and how he took care of his gear and all that. When I'm at the rodeo, mm-hmm. Uh, the high school rodeo is a little different. You you could, uh, you know, see a little more and pay attention a little bit more. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, you knew he had ability. Mm-hmm. And when he went to college, they took that to the next level. Okay. Yeah. Wow. His work ethic was very good. Yeah. And that is so cool to think, Pennsylvania Cowboy, right? Now, of course, we got Dalen and Colton out there representing. And, and some other members of the crew I'd like you to – to, to list off and through the 20 year or better that you were a stock contractor cowboys that have gone on that that made it made quite a name for themselves and also you got a crew out there still going now yeah um what i would like to say there there was uh, also a, a boy that won the high school bareback riding from pennsylvania okay and one that won the calf roping okay um good friend of mine's Dale Smith, his boy yeah. DJ Smith, DJ. won the co- high school finals, and uh, just in a, and people think you know high school rodeo, you know, but this is to win these events is huge. These they have kids from all of, over the United States, the best four from every state yep. that is in the high school rodeo. Yep. Uh, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Mexico. This this to win one of these is just incredible, yeah. and uh, yeah. it was uh, it was an honor to see these kids go on. And I would do it a little different. Like at the start of the year, you didn't know what was coming in, so you'd bring in kind of the weakest, easiest stuff you could could to see how they do. Sure. And by the end of the next spring, when they were getting ready to go to the finals, I would really step it up to you know try to push them to get to that level. You bet. You bet. And I remember DJ, uh, what a roper, how fun to watch, and what a heck of a trick roper. So when he came to a high school rodeo, he had double duty there. He not only was competing, but he was also entertaining, Sam. Yeah, and uh, we used him probably at every high school rodeo to do his trick roping. Yep. He was there. It was cheap, and it was good entertainment. And and great entertainment. I do have a picture downstairs of him. Uh, trick roping and yeah it uh and who was the bareback rider you were talking about i i can't remember his name okay uh nice kid he, he was originally from utah his family was from utah okay and he his father they were back here working and so they moved here for a while and they did go back to utah um and it's crazy i can't remember his name and when I, he first came on you know it wasn't anything special he rode mm-hmm. okay mm-hmm. but when i started stepping the horses up towards the end of the year mm-hmm. and uh like the last rodeo he made 
over an 80 point ride, which was legit. And I said, wow, this kid's got a really shot to do it. And he yeah. won it that year. He won it that year. Yeah. Representing the state of Pennsylvania. Correct. Isn't that cool? And another name that comes up, uh, Tyler Walt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we saw him come up through high school rodeo. I was, I was part of the trip when you moved him to college rodeo. If you remember that, you come down through Louisville. We had yeah. dinner or whatever as we come through. He was headed to the University of Tennessee, Martin also, right? Correct. And now he is an assistant coach there. He is? Yeah. Okay. But uh, in Tyler, I didn't have a lot to do with Tyler. Okay. Uh, his dad really knew rodeo, and uh, and actually he was the one that really helped the ASCII boy and okay. Tyler. Okay. They grew up together okay. and, and did it. So they were more elite on before they came to me. I see. They knew what they were doing. They took care of business. They they did it right. But uh, the progress, the, the things that I did do for Tyler that made him mad uh, at the time. Yeah. He came back and thanked me for it because he said, "I I know I wasn't ready for for that." And, right. Uh, right. He said it it just. Yeah, for what you did, it was good. What did you do? Do you remember? Yeah, I uh, he had drawn. He was still in high school, I think, yeah. and drew one of my really, really rank horse. It was Buck, at a pro rodeo. At a pro rodeo. Okay. It was bucking horse of the year, and it was muddy and slippery. And I said, this horse is liable to fall. He bucks so hard, I'm, I'm going to take him out of the draw. Okay. Well, I did that. And he was thoroughly upset because he wanted to get on this one. And that's the desire you need. You want to get sure. on the rankest one. You might not be ready for him, but you think you are. Yeah. And you have to have that mentality. Yeah. So uh, he he was upset. But later on, he said, yeah, I, uh, I'm glad you did that. And did he ever get on that bronc in another, at another rodeo, do you know? Yes. He did? Yeah. And? It was well for him. Yeah. Good. But that was about three years later. Yeah, yeah, and, uh, yeah. So he had a bunch more miles on him. Yeah. Okay. And and in the early years, when did you start um, I, APRA? When did you start uh, getting a, in that association? I know you competed for the American Professional Rodeo Association for years, absolutely forever. When did you get your APRA card as a contract? That would have been uh, my first rodeo. It was. It was that yeah. was sanctioned APRA. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So you've been with them over all these years. Yes. I. Uh, my card number, and it started at one. So I'm not sure if it's, I think Mike's is 22, and I think mine's 54. But okay. Yeah, it's okay. ridiculously stupid. But, uh, <laughs> now, that's as a competitor you got that number. Right, yeah. Okay. Do you have a separate card then as a contractor? No, they just, they, uh, they use your same card number and all that. Okay. So okay. Uh, okay. you just become a contractor. You have to re do the requirements, and you keep the same number. What are the requirements? Um, in the APRA, they weren't too strenuous. You had to do two or three rodeos a year, and you had to have X amount of livestock, and uh, it uh, put up a bond I was and things say. like that. But, and a uh, bond that for performance? That no. No. No, for a yearly bond. Uh for, or and you only had to put that up maybe the first two years and and then and that and the and if you failed somehow they the APRA got paid off that bond i guess i don't know how it worked okay but, uh, okay it's like a financial guarantee is what i understand of a bond yeah that you'll show up and That's do your <laughs> job exactly okay you know. so no show maybe yeah yeah so the association is protected Correct. basically okay yeah. And then the IPRA card. I know you ha you were a competitor of the IPRA forever. Do you remember what year you got your IPRA stock contractor card? Um, no, I don't know the exact year. Yeah. I do know that uh, it was one of the first rodeos I did for the IPRA was in Connecticut. Um, it was a struggle to 
you might have had to do three there. So that would that means I would have had to do six rodeos, three ARA and three IRA, and figure out where you were going to get your contestants the best and uh, how to work it. Yeah. So, it, and like a competitor, you you work all year to qualify for the finals, right? As a stock contractor, you do what to get qualified to take stock to the finals? Yeah, they have to have so many trips. Uh, and like in the APRA, there was probably five or six contractors at the time. And then their finals were in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, which was an outstanding finals at that time. It was really good. At the Farm Show Arena. Correct. Yeah. And uh, so it was pretty competitive, like anything. You know, they wanted to get their stock there, and I wanted to get my stock there. And they would have a committee that selected them. And the IPRA was the same way, but it was even more difficult for me to get stock mm -hmm. to these mm -hmm. finals because it was in Oklahoma. I was in the Northeast. It wasn't big rodeos. You only had your local people coming to them. The one advantage, you know, I was still riding when I took the animals there. So if you had a good one, you can you could tell the guys about them. And I, in the saddle bronc riding, you know, I'd get a few every year. Mm -hmm. But uh, but it was done a lot on spreading the word. Yes. Do you, do you know this one Sam's got up there? Maybe it's Taxman or Corona Sunrise. Have you seen this bronc go? Yes. Right? Okay. And so they get selected for the for uh, to take them to the finals, and uh, I IFR maybe was four days of competition. So if you took one of your top Bronx there, how many how many times might they go out? How many times might they be bucked at a weekend like that? Uh, twice a weekend. They'd never go more than twice. Never go more than twice, and you got paid for them to go. Correct. Okay, and one of the one of the um, um, highest awards in professional rodeo as a stock contractor is to have a have a, the bucking horse or the bucking bull of the year. And they had three awards they handed out every year for the bucking livestock, one for the bareback of the year, one for the saddle bronc of the year, and one for the bull of the year. Correct. And you won a number of those. I mean, starting 2006 and so forth, you started to rack up some of those. And in 2007, those year-end bucking, that meant that was the best bronc or the best bull that anybody had seen that year in the IPRA. And you hit the trifecta in 2007. You had a bareback bronc. Corona Sunrise. Tell us about that bronc. That bronc, at that time, I was doing some of the bigger, better rodeos, okay. you know, okay. uh, in the Northeast. Yeah. So I was getting the good contestants were coming back and seeing what we had. That that horse came out of a truck load of broncs I bought from Dean Myers mm -hmm. out of North Dakota. Mm -hmm. um, and I bought 11 at. Lavender had, I think, that year from him. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were some really good ones in there. When we first bought Corona with the dummy, he uh, he flipped out in the box. He, was, he had a hair trigger. I mean, if something wasn't just right, he would flip out and he wouldn't stop. And uh, I know he flipped out in there, and the dummy f fell off for, oh, yeah, it had just the rigging on him okay. because the dummy, when he flipped out, fell down underneath him, and I'm yelling him, open the gate because I didn't want him stepping on it and hurting a foot or something. Yeah. And he went out there, and I tripped the flank as he left, and with that dummy, he bucked just as hard, and I thought, wow. The bank, no flank? No flank. Okay. But just that rigging around him, he yeah. wanted to buck it off. And uh, I thought, oh, Wow. Thank goodness I didn't flank him. I didn't do anything. You know, yeah. if he's bucking that hard without it, yeah, I, I, that was the best thing that could have happened. Yeah. So from 
from the start there when we bucked him with a dummy some more because I always tried to buck him about 10 times with a dummy to get him to get their feet and to learn where they're going and mm-hmm. all that stuff. Um, you know, I didn't put hardly any flank in him at first because he bucked so hard. And he uh, he ended up being an outstanding horse, just outstanding. Yep. How old was he when you got him? They were two. The whole load of horses really? were two two-year-olds. Year yeah. And when would you start working? At what age did you start? Was Go ahead. Yeah, two years old? Um, usually at three. At three. I, I would buck them with a dummy a few times. And uh, you, you might do it at two if they're big, strong, and, and ready to go. But, uh, yeah, it, at that time I did it when there were three. And you might take them to a rodeo when they're couple times a year and I wouldn't if I went taking young horses to a rodeo that you didn't know I might only take it so I could put buck them one time Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and only one a performance because I didn't want six colts in there flipping out and carrying on and then you then you get in trouble so uh did he get where he would settle down pretty good in the in the shoot no. No, never did through his never whole career. Did. He, if you really knew what you were doing, yeah, uh, and the guy was very smart or wise to him, you could get by him without him flipping out. Okay. But if you did something wrong, if your chaps went down and slapped him in the side or something, and when he started, he usually didn't stop. Really? You know, I've had him kick the slats out of the back where you had to put new ones in, and yeah. it, it got to... Uh, I got a little wiser to it at the end. I'd slide a wrestling mat down behind him. And when, and, and it's so strange. You know, it was wood, and he'd kick that till it broke. But with that wrestling mat, he'd only kick it a couple times. Really? Okay. And I don't know what the difference is or what. but uh, Another connection of wrestling and rodeo. Uh, <laughs> I, I didn't know that, that story. Uh, That's interesting. You know, uh, we had Sean Miner on here a couple weeks ago and asked him, you know, what, what horse did you make the most money on? What horse did you just enjoy getting on? And Corona Sunrise was his pick. And Sean rode him fantastic. That, those two clicked. They kind of had the both same personality, probably, the trigger. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when they opened the gate, Sean was 110%, and yeah. the horse horse was, you know, had a trigger finger that uh, yeah. Yeah. anything went different, he was going off. So. Yeah. Uh, same personality well he made he talked about breaking uh, about corona busting up you know boards in the buck and shoot and stuff mm-hmm. like that um so in 2007 he's he's bareback bronc of the year of the international professional rodeo association and by the way for for trivia in 2013 he was again the bucking horse of the year in 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 the ipra but coming back to 2007 you had a bronc saddle bronc uh, by the name of Tax Man, that in 2006 had won Bucking Horse of the Year, but now you got to double it up with Corona in 2007. Tax Man is Bucking Horse of the Year. What do you remember about that, Bronk? Tax Man was a big, pretty paint horse. Uh, just really the, the perfect size Bronk. You know, he wasn't overly huge. He probably weighed 1350. You know, he wasn't that. 1500 pound horse and he wasn't that 900 pound horse he was really good solid you know just what you're looking for in a horse and his name was tax man because the day i got him in the <laughs> truckload of horses he came with corona he did the same oh moment. my okay yeah. okay and that truckload of horses i got the auditor came to audit the taxes that day that day and uh when I look, when I came back after dealing with an auditor that day, I looked at him and I said, "Oh, <laughs> I dealt with tax man." Look, and he was so pretty, kind of stood yeah. out. And, okay. Uh, so okay. he got named tax man. And and if you remember that day of audit and and a whole truckload of um, two year olds, um, was that a pretty expensive day, Sam? Between the between- audit. <laughs> Between the audit, well, let's put it this way. The audit was way more expensive than the horses. Really? Yeah. Okay. I'm not the best bookkeeper. So, the so lessons learned. And 
let's say I'm, I'm interested. I'm a young man. I'm a young person. Maybe it's my wife and I are interested in starting a rodeo stock contracting business. Um, could you, do you have any advice from the accounting tax side that you would share, Sam? <laughs> yes. Uh, have somebody that knows how to do paperwork and do it right. You know, it wasn't that I made a lot of money, uh, but I didn't keep track of things they, that I should. Um, and I would advise against your wife doing it because mm -hmm. you can get in conflicts. And, okay. Uh, okay. But it, it might be the best thing if, if, if you just leave it up to her and she does a great job, that that's mm -hmm. fine if they mm -hmm. want to do it. But, uh, yeah, the, the audit cost me enough that I had to remortgage the house that I had paid Holy off. Holy cow. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. It was over a two year period. It was about 50,000. And the biggest thing, and I could have, I found a good accountant then when yeah. that was going on, so that was wonderful. But the biggest thing that I didn't didn't go to fight it is because they didn't know what to do. I had started the Canadian Rodeo Company at that time. Okay. And, of course, I wrote checks to people working in Canada, and some would come down here and work. And he said, I don't know what to do with you because these are – illegal workers i see and i, I would see. have never thought of it yeah you know yeah you know you think if they were from a different country that you almost think of canada canada as being part of the united states and i just never gave it a thought so when he said we don't know what to do with you but they didn't know what to do either so we're going to let that go and if it got opened back up they could find me for having you know, BJ Prince down here working and among other people that it was illegal. So I paid the money without, uh, well, you know, went to the bank and remortgaged the house and paid the Lord. money and no Good fighting. Man. Yeah. So. yeah. Now you were paying quarterlies and everything like that on a fairly regular basis. Not Tax? at all. Not at all. Not at all. Did not do things right in okay. any stretch of the imagination. Okay. So first bit of advice, get somebody that can really do your books right good accounting receipts, all of that. Um, do understand the immigration laws if you're going to hire somebody <laughs> from, from Canada. Uh, but I remember when you showed up, you sent me paperwork. Your accountant sent me paperwork. I had to fill out for my 1099. So when I was done announcing for the year, I got a 1099 from Rawhide Rodeo. So I remember when you went, when you got all your paperwork and all your ducks in a row. The other thing is, the other bit of advice pay your quarterly taxes so you're not paying those year-end fines and penalties and i know you've i know you've done this since then boy it's a lot easier to come up with that quarter's worth of taxes than having to do that on on filing day yeah and it's the right way to do it and you should do it right because they're gonna i mean education is expensive yeah. And it was an expensive education, <laughs> let me tell yeah. you. Yeah. At that time in my life, you know, I had done well before that riding and the house was paid off and everything was, you know, moving along good. And then you get that and it, it throws a big wrench in the system. And the more so than the accountant, the, the, the bookkeeper is so important. Yeah. So important. You bet. You bet. So back to 2007, you, you, you got the bareback bronc of the year. You got saddle bronc of the year. You got a bull of the year. I'm going to go with that in a minute. But I want you to put your competitor hat on right now. You are a saddle bronc rider. Let's say you're 32 years old, you being Sam at 32 years of age. And you show up and there's three broncs um, that I'm going to give you. You got three saddle broncs that were bucking horses of the year. Tall Timber, Taxman, and Mardi Gras. So which one do you want out of that pen first? Mardi Gras. Really? Okay. Yeah. Mardi Gras was a horse I bought at a buck and stock sale and wasn't real punchy when I bought him. I didn't give but 400 for him. Really? Okay. My nephew was learning to ride, and he just hopped out through there like 
perfect for a kid to learn to ride. Okay. Perfect. And I thought, well, I'll take him home for four hundred dollars. I'll take him home for Jeremy to to learn to ride on. Mm-hmm. And he came from Southern Rodeos, which was a pretty big firm down around the Houston area. Mm-hmm. And he stalled in the box and didn't, you know, and he just hopped out through there. I thought, oh, well, okay. So I bought him, brought him home, and he loved the cold weather. And he originally came from Canada. He had Harry Bold's brand on him, though. Mm -hmm. And, you know, looking back through the years, you know, trying to, after about the first year, he wasn't too, he was a good horse, but wasn't exceptional. Mm -hmm. But as it went on, he just got to, got to loving it and he he was outstanding just fun to ride he he was funny he'd walk out of the chute and when he dropped it was like okay come on and then when he by eight seconds he was really bucking and uh so sam at 32 years of age horse uh mardi gras has the kind of out that he's typical of your how many points uh, it depends how you ride them. Yeah, but, but uh, Sam, at 32. 85-ish? 85-ish. He, uh, the best score on him, maybe not the best trip, but the best score, Heath DeMoss had him at Marshfield, Massachusetts, and he was 89. 89 points on Mardi Gras. Yeah. Okay. So three more horses, bucking oh, one, horse. One more thing about yeah. Mardi Gras. Yeah. Like, I don't know his correct age. Mm-hmm. When he passed away two years ago, I would say I, I talked to Kristen Vold about him trying to figure out the year because they brand him with a uh, alphabetical and he had an N on him. Mm-hmm. And he passed away two years ago, mm-hmm. and he had to be over forty. Forty years, and really. Because when, when we're trying to figure out his age, it was 36 or something, and then he, he lived another eight years. And I thought he was old when I bought him. Yeah. But we had him for a long Holy time. Cow. And, yeah. And never stalled. Always out on the always out on pasture, right? Winter and everything. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. He, he loved the cold. I, I took him to Florida, and it's the only time he never bucked. Really? They, they might have gave a rear out of him. I never took him back because I went down there every year to do a rodeo. Yeah. And uh, he, he he just didn't, didn't like, like the heat. It. I'll be darned. Yeah. Okay. But he did okay up through here, and we're going to get to your rodeo run, your your classic top-end rodeo run here in a bit. He did okay even through some of the heat? Yeah. Okay. Summer didn't bother him. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah. Okay. Um, and I got three more Bronx that were Bronx of the year, and I'll get back to the 2007 per, um, uh, hat trick here in, in a bit. Um, so three more Bronx, Sam at 32 years of age, high time gal. And by the way, that's the, the picture that uh, we put up on uh, Sean Miner's second episode, him on high time gal. Um, Sidewalk Sally, fun to say, Sidewalk Sally, and if you, Tell me where the name come from. That'd be wonderful. And then finally, Nightlinger. Okay. Uh, well, um, High Time Gal was a horse that I purchased through a Buckingstock sale. Never seen her go, but liked her breeding. Sylvain Bourgeois from St. Tit and I were talking one day, and he said, look at this horse. You know, uh, she's bred really, really good. Uh, goes back to Devil Triangle, Calgary's, and uh, at the time she was consigned by Jim Lawrence. There was yeah. two horses with the same breeding there. Okay. And uh, I called the guy from North Dakota was going to the sale that I bought all the horses from, and I said, you know, look at these two horses. If they're any good, buy them for me. And uh, he bought them. And when he uh, they came back and... The one horse didn't make it. She she just didn't buck, and we, we sold her right away. Um, might have been a mistake. I might should have bred her and got some colts because of her bloodlines, but I didn't. Mm-hmm. At that time, I had about 200 horses, and I was horse stupid. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But High Time Gal was really 
outstanding. If you'd set the pickup man out there about 40 feet and just have him move away, she would have some wicked ducks and uh, really? kick. Okay. And, you know, if you rode her through that, it was something that a lot of guys didn't. She bucked a lot of them off. And uh, she was maybe not the most impressive horse I've ever owned, but probably one of the most solid that you never, you didn't have to worry about anything. She would always buck. And she came from Jim Lawrence. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah, you know, Sylvain kind of talked me into buying her, and he picked her up that day at the sale for okay. me. Okay, okay. So bought her sight unseen, basically. Correct. Okay. Um, Sidewalk Sally. Sidewalk Sally is uh, one we raised. Okay. Your uh, breeding program. Yeah. Okay. She uh, came came from uh, uh, out of one of the studs that I bought at the IFR sale years ago, which also Dean Myers put in there for sale. And uh, Savane and I were talking and bought him out of the breeding. And she was, uh, she, you know, she was big horse, really, really big and big bone, really bucked, okay. uh, not really bucked. I say <clears throat> she was, sometimes she was absolutely outstanding and other times she was just a horse. Okay. okay. So she must have had some outstanding horse trips to yeah. win yeah. bucking horse of the year. Yeah. And the name? I mean, you raised her. We raised her. <laughs> we won't get into that too much. Uh, really? You won't get into how she got her name, Sidewalk Sally? Uh, one, of, uh, one of the workers named her for me. Okay. Uh, by mistake, but uh, yeah. By mistake. All right. So, yeah, we are a PG crew here, right? Our show is PG. Maybe after you can share it with me. Yeah. And uh, maybe, maybe, maybe I can tell, maybe I can't tell. Sounds like probably not. Probably huh? not. <laughs> probably not. Uh, and then Nightlinger. Tell me about that, bro. Nightlinger. He uh, was one. I went to a buck and stock sale of the wines up in South Dakota. Um, I never met the man, but he uh, passed away, and they were selling his whole company out. Okay. And they sent me a flyer in the mail, and I thought, oh, you know. What what, and it was after the rodeos were over in October or something. So uh, I jumped in a truck and drove up to the sale. And me being the person I am, I got a little carried away. Uh, I couldn't buy as good horses. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. They went for quite a bit of money. But uh, what I, was quite a bit of money back then? Oh, they were seven to ten thousand. Oh wow! Okay. You know. Okay. And uh, so when it came down to it and i had bought some you know uh i bought 50 or 55 blue jeans out of there and as an older horse and mm -hmm. you know there was six or eight older horses i had bought and uh then they started selling the young horses and you could have your pick and they sold two or three off and they were four hundred dollars or something like that you know okay. and after two or three went they i i had my pick and i said i'll take them all mm -hmm. and yeah so went up there to buy a handful of horses and ended up with over 40 you brought 40 you bought 40 head while you were up there yeah one of my questions were going to be and i think you answered it do you enjoy going to bucking uh, sales and auctions like that? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I spend too much money. I get, and once I get started, it's like uh, I get stupid. You know, okay. If I never start, I'm okay. You are. Yeah. Okay. But uh, it, you know, when I on the way home, when I called BJ, I said, I'm either going to look really smart or really stupid. Yeah. Because these young horses, and they couldn't afford the other ones, but the bloodlines were there. And they didn't all turn out, yeah. but yeah. there was some really good ones. Uh, they they did a lot of numbers. They were must have lived on a reservation and uh, okay. did a lot of lot of numbers of animals. But uh, there was some really nice colts, and I I know the first two were 
probably the best ones in the bunch because people knew what they were going when they picked them. Sure. Uh, and the son came up to me and he said, well, will you sell me this horse, this colt, you know, in there? And I thought, oh, man, you know he's going to take the best one. Mm-hmm. But his mm-hmm. father just killed, yeah. got killed. Yeah, yeah. You know, so what do you do? I said, yes, I'll, I'll sell you that horse. And then that horse is a four-year-old, went to the American and uh, if you know about rodeo, that was one of the biggest rodeos ever yeah. to go on. Absolutely. So uh, there, were, there were some good ones in there, uh, Nightlinger being probably the best. When, when we bucked that horse as a colt with a dummy, he wouldn't, couldn't get him loaded and shoot. We couldn't. It, it was just horrendous. We ended up pulling him in with a tractor. Really? Into the chute for Into the first the time? Chute. He just saw up and wouldn't move, and there wasn't nothing he could do. And they opened the gate, and he ran to the other end, just duck and dive, and just terrible. I, I called a friend in Florida that I was taking the horses down to, and I said, I got a ranch bronc ride, ranch horse for it, because he would have been hard to ride. Yeah. And uh, as it went on, he, uh, he kept getting better and better and uh, ended up being really good horse. Wow. You got to have faith to keep hauling them, to keep trying them. Yeah, uh, faith or see something in them, right? That uh, right. And he had enough moves that I thought he would would buck, but I wasn't confident in it. Yeah. And we kept doing it, and yeah, worked out. And he was two time bucking horse of the year, by the way, too. and bucking horse of the finals, and one bucking year. horse of the finals also. Yeah. So, so here, put your, put your competitor hat back on, uh, Sam at 32 years of age, you're at the IFR, three horses, uh, are in the pen. Which one do you want to draw? High time gal, sidewalk, Sally or Nightlinger? Nightlinger. Nightlinger. Easy, easy pick for you. Uh, not, not easy. Cause, uh, sidewalk Sally, I wouldn't have took her because she wasn't as consistently outstanding uh probably the best one when she was yeah um okay high time gal was going to make you earn every point and if you could get there on her okay but uh nightlinger was a little more rider friendly and as i have said for years they pay you when it's easy yeah so (laughs) right so nightlinger sam's 32 top of the game um, how many points are you? Nightlinger has a has a good trip. Nightlinger has a good trip, probably eighty three. Eighty three. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, and then finally, the the third uh, bull or the third rough stock animal of the year in two thousand seven was your bull Bloody Sunday. So you win the bareback bronc of the year, saddle bronc of the year, bull of the year. What do you remember about Bloody Sunday? Bloody Sunday, I purchased him from Ways of Sanchez. Okay. Up in... Uh, Canadian S- bull. Yeah. Okay. He, he come out of Western Canada. Uh, he would always bring a truckload to St. Tate. Um, pretty much a lot of young, wild bulls that... Uh, he had a great pen of bulls, and they were just kind of wild and crazy and uh they really bucked and this one when i bought him he actually ran off i mean didn't run off but he didn't turn back like he's supposed to and wayne was pissed he was mad and uh i said geez yeah if you're mad he'll work here you know (laughs) yeah yeah we got to talking and uh I lowballed him, and he came back at me with something, and I said, "Man, well, Whoopi does that forever. He ain't gonna be any good." Well, he bucks, he bucks, and <laughs> then uh, he, I got him bought, and actually, I didn't ever use him much. Uh, BJ kept him up in Canada was pretty much the whole time. Oh, really? Okay. And okay. When and we, qualified him for the finals from up there. Up there. Okay. The first year we couldn't get him across the border because of Mad Cow. Second okay. year, he okay. uh, couldn't get him across the border for Mad Cow. And then when that opened up, I got him back across the border, and he knocked the hip down. So he never went to the finals. For you, you mean? 
as Buck and Bull of the Year, he never made it to the finals. He was Buck and Bull of the Year. Oh, really? But oh. Because of mad cow disease, we couldn't get him across the border the first two years. And the third year, oh, I see. the director said, okay, that bull's never been here. Is he going? I said, I have him at my house. Yeah. He will be there. Yeah. I called him up two weeks later and said, he's got a hip down. I, he's losing weight. You know, I got a chiropractor coming out. We got it back up. Mm-hmm. He wanted to fight with everything. He got it back down, and I he just wasn't in the shape. Uh, so, so what do you mean a hip down? Um, it'd be like having I don't know if you ever gone to the chiropractor and have your hips out of out of place. It's not out of socket, but it's mm-hmm. it's just out of place. And with the bulls, their hips are so high on there, and if it gets the muscles get weak in the top and uh if you're fighting or one hits you at the side or something it's like if you do work in and you throw your back your hips are out of place a little bit and then the muscles if you keep going the muscles get weak there and it won't hold it in place and that's what happens here okay and you brought a chiropractor out yeah okay actually you're going to speak with him uh tomorrow rob yeah okay rob right yeah, okay. and he got it back in. He started putting weight on and everything, and then he he got to feeling good, and put him back with the other bulls, and he went to fighting again. And you know, they're they're like little kids. They're gonna have to be the king of the heap, and <laughs> right, and yeah. and injured himself in the process. Yeah, I'll be done. Okay, so big year two thousand seven. That that had to be is that one of your most memorable years walking away with three trophies three buckles definitely the most memorable year yeah yeah, yeah. and then in addition buck in, of course you were you were working with saint teat and they became the outdoor rodeo of the year in the ipra for some 20 years straight yeah well such a well-deserving award it uh, it's hard to compare that rodeo to any other rodeo yeah yeah and then um, talking about your rodeos, you had you had your pro rodeos during the that uh, you had for for many many years, and looking down through the list, uh, Ellicottville kicked off your pro season uh, over the Fourth of July. Uh, the Kent family started not far from here. What are they? An hour and a half, two hours from here to Ellicottville. Yeah. And how did that come to be? That that's a kind of a strange scenario. Um, the owner of Ellicottville was at the Gary Rodeo watching, and he t- went to a contestant and said, "You know, how do we do a rodeo at our place?" And the contestant gave him my my name. Okay. And uh, we got a hold of him, and I actually I don't know why, but I was really busy or something. I had a hard time getting down there, and I sent Mike down to talk to him. And uh, he talked with him, and then Mike is my brother. Mm-hmm. And he came back, and he said, I think he's really serious about it. And maybe that's why I didn't go down, because I didn't think he was serious. Okay. okay. And it's only an hour and a half away, but it, it just didn't. But uh, we went down and signed a contract and did two performances, uh, rodeo there. Okay. And uh, then it's just built. Now it's four performances, and really is getting fantastic crowds and so i was the first one to do that rodeo until i sold out and the other company took it over yeah okay okay and and uh when i think of the kent family of course you got john the son apra bull rider right wins the championship there and then daughter tammy she did a lot of trick riding for you as a contract act yes she did uh john senior i mm-hmm. guess we'll call him mm-hmm. uh when i would he's very frugal on what he what he does with the for his committee and uh paying uh contractors or whatever and he he seen what i was paying the contract act he said this is crazy this is crazy you know <laughs> yeah and uh I'm going to get my daughter to start trick riding. I said, oh, really? yeah? <laughs> really? Good luck with that, you know? And, and she wasn't trick riding before this? Oh, she was only like 10 or 12 or 13. Oh I don't know if that was the year. That, yeah, yeah. You know, it was probably a few years later. She's yeah. probably 15 or 16 when he said this to me. And uh, 
I thought, yeah, yeah, good luck with that. And then, lo and behold, did he prove me wrong. Oh, my goodness. What an outstanding trick rider and a good person. And, it, it, yeah, she got to, got with uh, my wife's sister, and they, mm-hmm. they trick mm-hmm. rode at the mm-hmm. Longhorn Rodeos and yeah. things like that. And wow. I didn't know that story. What an interesting story of how one gets involved in trick riding. And, and this was... <laughs> This was a business deal. There was a business reason. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't want to pay the big money for yeah. these folks. I'll produce my own act. Yeah. And then probably got so busy, she couldn't get home and do her dad's rodeo? <laughs> <laughs> well, she was always there when we had trick riders there. Did she? Until was she? she didn't want to do it anymore. Okay. And okay. then, you know, she is so talented on other things. She put an opening together that is amazing. Yeah. Uh, and... It, it uh, yeah, there was two of them. She did one that was copied from, uh, I think it was John Wayne. That, no, Johnny Cash did it, it and uh, that was good. And she did that, but she put one together from scratch that is the best opening I've ever seen. Really, and we've used it at many rodeos. We didn't don't use it every year because you want to come back with something a little different, but. Probably every three or four years, we'll put that back in, and the crowd goes crazy. Really? Great, great, great. Um, And then your summer run, you'd go from Ellicottville, which was over the 4th of July, depending on how that fell. The very next weekend, you'd be in Ford City, Pennsylvania. We've talked a little bit about this rodeo. Um, The thing that always stood out for me on that rodeo, number one, there were a number of things. Number one, out in the middle of nowhere, right? Right. You had to know where to go. Number two, the crowds were, were insane, just huge numbers of crowds. Um, and number three, the rodeo committee was rodeo cowboys that said, we need to have a rodeo here in our hometown. Um, Jeff Altmeyer mm-hmm. was a driving force. Jack Lineman was on that committee. Um, chiropractor. Um, team Roper. Yeah. Alan. <laughs> Alan. Reefer. Reefer, right? Um and, uh, gosh, I'm, I'm re- forgetting some of these names. Who drove the tractor and had the ground in absolutely, positively the best rodeo conditions ever? Uh, Elaine Reefer's father. father. Yes, and I am drawing a blank, and I don't know why. I know him for oh. 40 years. Very, very good man and knows what he's doing. Uh, yeah, really but boy, you had the ground there. You oh, had the he, ground there. He, an outstanding. He brought his own tractor, his own equipment, and away he went. Away he went. Yeah. Absolutely. One of the few places you didn't have to worry about it being right. He took care of it. You bet. Yeah. Knew if it was going to rain, they knew how to seal it off and yeah. not allow the water, the moisture to, to soak in and make it muddy. Probably the best ground I've ever been in that I have put on rodeos at. You bet. Yeah. And you've had a lot of talent come through there. I mean, um, uh, Keith Isley. Hollywood Harris, Robbie Hodges came through there, uh, and Liesl Harris. Yes, the, the Liesl, and I never, I, I seen him when I was a kid and just was hilarious, just hilarious. He used to work for the Longhorn Rodeo, and uh, back before I was riding, it was, I uh, went with one, with Mike to one of them, and he had a piano act that I just roared over, you know, and uh, to get him to come to that rodeo was incredible. Incredible, and high point in my career. I mean, it was two years before I retired, um, Liesl Harris coming in, and I sat with him for hours listening to his stories. Hmm. Just an amazing talent. Matter of fact, I saw a picture posted today uh, on the Liesl Harris Facebook page, and I'll put that in our notes. Um, and it was, and the description was while he was building that piano, his prop, mm-hmm. while he was building that piano, he almost cut off three fingers with a saw. And they were contemplating amputating them. Oh. Okay. And the doctor asked what he did for a living, and he said, I'm a pianist, I play the piano. And they got the specialists in, and they saved his fingers. <laughs> Today's Facebook page post. Oh. 
So <laughs> good story, good tie-in. Uh, lots of good talent coming through there. I remember, I remember the boys, you know, Colton and Dalen riding there, Raymond, Hofstetter, another of your crew that's out there, Eli, all these cowboys coming through there. Your your nephew, uh, Jason Runfola, uh, a lot of good cowboys come through there. And, and so that would be a Friday, Saturday night show. And then... The following Thursday, you would move from there up the road about three hours, four hours to Benton, Pennsylvania. Yes. And great rodeo, great rodeo committee. We got to get that committee on here. Dan and Dave and uh, the whole crew. We just got to get them on here. Yeah, I I think uh, it would be well-deserving. You know, you're going to get Attica on this week and then we'll go down and try to get them on because well, so. so many stories, you know, when they started and how they started and it, uh, yeah, it, it's amazing. You yeah. Bet. And, and then speaking of Attica, you'd, you'd move from Benton to Attica a couple of weeks later. Mm-hmm. That was always the first weekend, I believe in August. That's kind of their date. Yeah. Their date's the first Saturday, first, first Saturday okay. of every of August or of first August. Friday, first full weekend of August. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, and, and to your point, uh, tomorrow we're going to be talking with Dave Wheeler, the, the gentleman that started that rodeo uh, 65 years ago this year. They just celebrated their 65th year. Uh, so we're going to be talking with him tomorrow while we're up here in the Rawhide Ranch uh, recording studio. We're going to be talking with him tomorrow. And then, um, and then in the schedule, you'd move to a big rodeo. And I mean big rodeo in that. Went over a lot of days in a very impressive rodeo. Been there a long time, North Washington. Yeah, we, uh, we were lucky enough to get a call to come down and talk to them about doing their rodeo. And I really thought it was a long shot. Mm-hmm. But... Uh, mm-hmm. I put the work into what we could do or and putting on the show. And they had uh, Bob Barnes was there, which goes back to your Iowa contacts. Absolutely. Uh, and he had been doing that rodeo for several years. Uh, the last year he did it, he didn't, the, didn't get the contestants, didn't yeah. come in. Because they were staying there. When I'd go there and ride, you had to be there four days. And yep. compete. It was a five performance rodeo and it's a four header. And towards the end on a Saturday night, which you know is your biggest night, uh, a lot of the bull riders stayed and went to Cowtown and didn't come there. And it upset the committee, rightfully so. Yep. Uh, they yep. had Saturday night with three bull riders, you know, and they didn't. Uh, so uh, we went in had meetings uh we all went and gave our spiel and what was going on and they uh they chose me to do their rodeo and change it from a prca to an ipra rodeo yeah and the first year was phenomenal we had contestants everybody that had ira card was there and it, it went good and the association came and talk to the committee and uh now they have a rapport and it was just uh, a real good deal and when i bought my prc prca company mm-hmm. i asked them you know did you want to go back to prca no, no they they did not they were happy we were at that um we it's the only rodeo i ever signed a four-year contract oh wow they sat me down and said you know after the first year, they said, whether our 50th is in four years or something like that. I don't remember what year it was, but yeah. uh, they said, we want to make sure you're here through that. And okay. uh, we okay. signed a four-year contract that okay. day. Okay. And one of the things that's amazing there, Doug, is uh, they have the first contract that they ever wrote is in the kitchen of their building. That they that they ever wrote what the very 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 start of the whole thing. Correct. Okay. Yeah. And okay. It, it's a yeah. When you read it, it's very interesting. Handwritten, all you know. Yep. I think the contract price for five performances was twelve hundred dollars and a percentage of the gate. Really. 
Okay. No. Oh, wow. Can you imagine? And in talking about relationships and everything, Dave Hazlett was, was on that committee or a big influencer through that, and he went on then and became president of that uh, committee for a while? Yeah. Um, Dave was, uh, he was just there doing a lot of the work the first few years. Okay. And uh, got to know him from there, and he started traveling around to, pretty much every rodeo we did mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. i would get to him and his wife would cook for the crew boy it, they did too now yeah it was wonderful because yeah. when it was over everything was closed down yeah the crew wouldn't get to eat slack might be you know get done an hour or two after the performance and you had to feed all the animals mm -hmm. At, when you went to their trailer we'd sit down have a drink and uh dinner and talk about the rodeo you bet. and uh was was a great asset to the business you know because you know if there weren't young kids out going off to drinking you had them right there you bet and uh you bet. was was an asset of okay what can we fix tomorrow what went wrong mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. debrief yeah yeah you know yeah. and it, it was really good and the social aspect of it right yeah yeah so very and, very nice yeah and he and he judged for you quite a bit. Yes, uh, in the later years, he went to the judging clinic and got mm -hmm. his card, and he judged rodeos in the ARA. I don't think he ever did the IRA. Rodeos, okay, okay. But uh, his boy that Wade. started started bullfighting for me mm -hmm. years ago mm -hmm. um, as a favor to a friend, and here you go. Um, a friend of mine came up and said, well, this, this guy's dating my daughter. He went to bullfighting school. He wants to fight bulls, you know. Yeah, and yeah. I said, yeah, okay. Well, we'll have him do some high school stuff. And nice guy. Took care of business. You could count on him being there, you know. Just just good. One day I thought we killed him at uh, a fair rodeo in Pennsylvania. I got bull well, got him hung over the horn and he spun him around and slapped the ground and i thought oh my wow. goodness but uh, yeah. great kid great yep. family yep. it's good to see that uh how, how well they've done it with you the bet years. you bet um and then of course the icing on the cake maybe for the whole year is is saint t um your final rodeo of the year before you headed to finals and that sort of thing and we've talked a lot about saint t on this uh my goodness in september we we're up there and got to visit it and see what it has become. And I know when you first started up there, it was just a couple performances, right? Yeah, it was just two performances, both Saturday afternoon and Sunday afternoon. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it was it was a great rodeo, don't get me wrong, but what they have built it into uh, with Savane's guidance, you know, it, it has turned into a nine-performance rodeo. Yep, and yep people everywhere yeah and then one other thing i i don't want to skip over um this probably has to be early 2000s you started your own bull riding association called the hardway uh bull riding association hardway rodeo association why did you start that um more for insurance reasons okay out of necessity, yeah, yeah. Um, I was advised if they had a card, they were admitting to what they were doing. I see. So if you could sell them a card for $50, cheap card that uh, would protect your liability somewhat, um, we went that route. Okay. And, and you started then, that became its own product, meaning you would go into some of the fairs around one day, one day events, and you could offer just bull riding to those, to those committees. Yes. It, uh, it started out to protect myself for mm -hmm. buck outs at the house. Okay. Okay. Um, that's what it started out as. And as you grew and the guys got better, you know, it, it would be nothing to buck 50 or 70 bulls at the house. Right. And uh, <laughs> right. as it went on, okay, well, we got people here. We can do the PBR was taken off, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. we we took this and uh, started selling it as a product on the road, and 
it, it worked out really well. The ones that actually the bull ridings probably cost me more financially because you had to lease some bulls if you're okay. bucking forty bulls or okay. whatever there. Yeah, uh, but they were easier to do, mm -hmm. um, easier set up and tear down, mm -hmm. and it uh, it was a good option. It, you did it a little cheaper than a rodeo. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't have, but right. you did. Okay. Uh, but, and you didn't need all the parking of horse trailers if, if you couldn't do something like that. And if it was a narrow track, you could, uh, there was times I put the buck and shoots on both ends. And, you know, if six didn't fit across there, you did three on a side. Yep. And you just made it work. It, it yeah. was sometimes where you couldn't do a rodeo, you could do a bull riding. Okay. And, and, the remnants of that association it's not around anymore right correct but the the legacy of that still continues at benton the sunday night performance was started and there wasn't even a sunday night performance when you started going up there the sunday night performance was put together just for bull riding i think he had bulls and barrels or something like that Correct. So to have that product and look at that, that some 20 years later, that that is still happening on a Sunday night up there. And that's incredible that it, it has grown into what it is. When I first sat down and pushed the idea to the committee, they said, ah, that's a good idea, I think, but we don't want to do it. We don't want to spend the extra money. Yeah. And I said, well, what if we go on partners with it? You pay me half uh, the gate of yeah. what we do. Yeah. And it was okay. You know, it, it, I didn't lose money. Um, I was already there. Everything was set up. You know, I had a, some bull, bull lease, and we did bulls and barrels. And yeah. now, after about the third year, they said, ah, we'll pay you the money, and yeah. we'll just take it all. Yeah. You know, and now it is the biggest night of the rodeo really bigger sunday than night. saturday night sunday at seven thirty is the hardest ticket to get of the whole weekend really yeah okay and that's something how that all progresses you know we're going to be talking tomorrow with dave wheeler who started the attica rodeo right back in the late 50s um and the one aspect that we you just touched on is okay, I've got a rodeo company. I can come in and do every bit of your rodeo, start to finish. We're going to bring in the cowboys, cowgirls, the rodeo athletes. Um, but you guys got to figure out how to get the people in the seats. And so we're going to get a perspective there tomorrow, Sam. Yeah, and the most important part of it. <laughs> yeah, without a doubt. <laughs> and, and, you know, why I didn't go on too many percentages because I didn't have control of it. Uh, it was their job to get the people in the seats and to make the money that way. And yeah. it was hard to say, oh, I'll, I'll yeah, I'll do your rodeo for Take half of what you make and right. lose, you know, $20,000. But with Benton, they were already established. They had a working committee. It didn't cost them any more to advertise for that Sunday. You is what the whole weekend. So they weren't sticking their neck out too far. I see. And, uh, isn't yep. that cool how it all progresses and grows? So talking about progressing and growing, um, BJ Prince, we, we mentioned him earlier, Ontario Cowboy. He came down. He came down to ride high school, stuck around for a long time. You finally put him in a car and sent him back home and said, you got to go to college, right? You got to go to school. Finish high school, actually. You, you got to finish school. We need you educated. No. Um, and then even after all that education, he decides he wants to be at a rodeo business. Um, so talk about, let's talk about starting uh, Rawhide Canada. Um, it was a challenge, a, a huge challenge. Uh, somebody came to me and wanted to do a rodeo up there. And I said, eh, you know, do I want to do it? Don't I want to do it? And I thought, well, BJ was working for him. We could, we, we could do it. So I, I checked into everything and I, it's always been a challenge living where I live an hour and a half from the Canadian border mm -hmm. that stops you from going places that you want to go to 
Sure. Okay. Sure. So I did the rodeo up there, and it was a success for them, a mm-hmm. failure for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, a financially. failure for you. Okay. Financially. Uh, mm-hmm. I was going to make a little money, and the government came and took all that. And then it was, you know. But I did, at the time, I did see the advantages to being there. Mm-hmm. Um, would I do it again? Hell no. Cause okay. The border crossing, we couldn't get into this place until a certain time. And it, you know, it's not like, okay, you're going somewhere. It was a big arena. Mm-hmm. It wasn't like you're going to a fairgrounds, you're pulling three days early and you're ready. We sat out on the highway for a couple hours till they got ready for us with the dirt and everything to come in to do it. So okay. it, it was, you know, foolish, but it's what you do, you know. Right. Right. And I, I seen they had good crowds and things went well. Um, I, I seen the possibilities. Uh, did I know it would be that difficult or cost so much because th- it was 40 cents on the dollar and I was spending U.S. dollars and, yeah. you know, it, it yeah. just wasn't wasn't good short term. Now for BJ, it's ended up being I don't, you know, it's like any rodeo business. He's not making millions, but uh, yeah. he's doing well. Did you partner with him pretty early on financially? Well, pretty pretty early on, it was all Sam. Oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> for sure. Wise, for, know, sure. He, for sure. He did the paperwork and all that that needed done, but okay. uh, it was okay. all my money and my livestock and uh-huh. all that. Okay. But he sold the rodeos, he organized the rodeos, put them on pretty much, had the crew. Yeah, first we were going up there, it was most all our people, mm-hmm. um, but after about three years, it, it kind of was his baby then, you know, mm-hmm. it, uh, mm-hmm. we got busier and he got busier and he he had one guy that he was doing most of the rodeos for, it was a telemarketing scenario, and that kind of went to the wayside. And he had to go out and start hustling rodeos, and he did. He did. Yeah. Okay. The Rawhide Rodeo, when we go look at the Rawhide Rodeo website, he's keeping all that up and that sort of thing? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And I'm going to encourage our our listeners to go there. A lot of these awards we've been talking about are all posted up there, the rodeo schedule, everything that they got going. A lot of history about Rawhide Rodeo is up there, so we're going to really encourage you to go check that out if you can. So let's let's get to the second of the last topics I want to cover. Um, selling the Rawhide Rodeo Company in the U.S. Um, when did you start looking? When did it cross your mind? It was time to to sell. Um, how'd that come about? It, it I started looking about three years before. Or I started looking. It, it crossed my mind about mm-hmm. three years before the contestants were getting fewer and far between uh you had to really work to get bull riders even bull riders back when you'd get 30 then you were getting five a performance right Right. you know uh horse riders were obsolete you know if we didn't have our own guys on the crew which was amazing towards the end the crew was fantastic you know all the years struggling through the years but at the end i had an outstanding crew with uh, Raymond and Colton and Dalen and Eli, you know, mm-hmm. hardworking, mm-hmm. just good people mm-hmm. that uh, didn't fuss or whatever, just did the job. And then you had three horse riders with you right there. Yep. You know, yep. Uh, steer wrestler, calf roper, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. and a bull rider that you could count on to finish the show. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> yeah. So we sold a lot of shows with Dalen. We sold a lot of shows. But when I started letting them go to other rodeos, you seen the writing on the wall. You know, they're going out there and winning money at these other rodeos, and I need them here. And, you know, it's time uh, yeah. for many reasons. Contestants being one, um, the the boys are getting good enough to go off on their own you can't hold them back Mm -hmm. you know that's what you that's what you work for you know uh and uh the the logistics on uh marriage and the the work the inner works of the rodeo that just 
caused havoc. Mm -hmm. So uh, mm -hmm. it, it definitely was time. Mm -hmm. And I seen it about three years before I did it. Okay. And when I, uh, you know, I kind of said something to a few people, but you can you couldn't go out and advertise because you got signed committees mm -hmm. to sign contracts and you don't want them to hear that you're ready to sell out. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so it, it was a fine line. But uh, when we found somebody that was interested, they we had their crew come and work with us for a year. Mm -hmm. And when they finally got the finances gathered up, he bought it out and, and I was done. You know, after that, I never was a part of it again they they took it over and ran okay so and that was december of 2019 yes november 7 november, november 7. or december i don't know uh before the end of 2019 yeah, right you, before COVID hit you transferred ownership yep. you and you still had a few bronx that you continued to raise yeah when they bought the company they bought the PRCA card mm -hmm. and uh, and the company they had to buy fifty horses and twenty five bulls and twenty five to bulls. go with it. So I had about at that time probably fifty or seventy five horses left over. Okay, uh, got rid of all the bulls and you know all that stock, but uh, yeah. And then equipment uh, arenas and shoots. They bought everything, they lock, bought stock, everything. and barrel. Okay. Uh, trucks trailers uh right down to flanks i sent everything with them when they bought it they had complete control of it okay and so when you're out you got nothing to buck meaning you got no flanks to even <laughs> or, or whatever so you you said time to go yeah it, it definitely was okay so here's the final topic then um learning what you have learned over this 30 years of being a stock contractor and the years and years and years of a competitor before that someone comes to you today right i set the scenario up earlier i want to get in the rodeo business what's what's your advice to me right now other than run <laughs> <laughs> uh, if my advice would be Keep your day job, okay. if if possible. Yeah. Um, get other people involved mm -hmm. that can handle some of the load because the load is astronomical trying to do it by yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you could split up, like the trucking aspect is one LLC and uh, the bull aspect is another LLC, somebody to do the timed events and the calves, yeah, yeah, I think um, it would be such a a wise a wise way to go. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it wouldn't be like you're controlling the whole ship, but it it would be where you could still enjoy it, go to mm -hmm. the weekend. You wouldn't have to do thirty rodeos a year to survive. Mm -hmm. You know, because mm -hmm. you're not really sticking your head out to trucking. They could truck other than. The rodeos you're not on the weekend sure you know sure the, the only thing like the time event cattle would be should have a cow calf operation then you can put them in the feedlots when they're done the steers you're going to lose money on no matter what yeah. unless you put them you know you're going to lose money on the steers right but uh bulls and horses you know use your head uh get some really good ones to take the big rodeos and some to just do rodeos with okay and have a good accountant a good bookkeeper <laughs> keep all your paperwork filed and at your fingertips and pay your darn taxes quarterly bookkeeper is so important so important yeah and understand the risks right make sure you got the right kind of insurance for going down the road insurance and i would definitely try to do separate llc's for every aspect of it just then, you know, I never did one till after I quit, and I have always was going to do two, one for All-American, one for Rawhide, but I never did uh, financial aspect, but kind of important. Perfect. Any other final words, Sam, before we say goodbye and uh, 
rodeo contracting business? Well, um, I want to thank you for coming out. Yeah. I appreciate it. Uh, and the rodeo contracting business is for meeting people, and it, it's wonderful. The yeah. committees, yeah. you know, they were all good. Uh, of course, it's like anything. Some were better than others, but mm -hmm. uh, you met a lot of good people and, mm -hmm. and a lot of good friends through the years. Okay. Uh, a lot of headaches in the business, but yeah. a lot of good people. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Well said, well said. All right. Well, thank you, Sam. We're going we're gonna to say goodbye to our listeners now. And we hope that you enjoy our conversation about the business of rodeo. If you do, please share it with your friends. Spread the word. To make your listening easier, you can find us on all the major platforms for your streaming. Search for Beyond the Shoots and follow us. And remember, we want you to check out the Facebook page for the New York State Rodeo Museum group page and become a member. It is what started this podcast. And we'd also like to th uh, say thank you to Parasite Systems for their support with our podcast. Parasite System is a push-button parasitic diagnostic system for pasture animals, horses, cattle, goats, sheep, chickens, and for your companion animals, your dogs and your cats. You can find them at ParasiteSystems.com. And remember, we've got a coupon, BTC023, for 50% off your test kits. You want to get those test kits in? Can we say test more than treat if possible? And this is Beyond the Shoots with... Sam Swearingen. Until next time, this is Doug Simcox. Thank you for listening.